Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to the nervous system. James, what are you talking about? Well, here it is, folks. This here is at least part of what we refer to as the nervous system. Now, I don't think you guys will be in any way surprised if I suggest to you that you are looking at an illustration of the brain. There it is. The old grey mat, although we got it in pink here, up the top of the old, uh, up in the Swede, up at the top. And we also, of course, have here the spinal cord. Now, I don't think that will surprise any of you. And what I want to quickly summarise, there's a spinal cord right there. What I want to summarise is that these things together, these represent what we refer to as the central nervous system. The brain and the spinal cord, by definition, are the CNS, the central nervous system. But we, of course, have another part to the nervous system. And this is where we can start to get into the application and how this relates to sport, exercise and health. We also have what is referred to now as the PNS. Now, let me change colour here. This here is the PNS. Now, I will write this one out for you because it's a little more detailed. This is the peripheral nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system, which I've matched up sort of colour-wise here with my sort of aqua green or whatever it's called, the peripheral nervous system here, we can define in the following ways. It is both what we refer to as the peripheral nerves you can see them sort of leading down into the fingers into the legs etc we've got the peripheral nerves but we also here include or what the description we could use is any nerve outside outside of the cns so we are trying to get across here that the that the nervous system is made up of both the central and the peripheral aspects and of course neither can function without the other well i suppose technically. anyway i'm not going to get into that now what i really want to get into is sort of like how these how the system goes about influencing i guess movement and response to movement and also the interpretation of the environment as a whole so this is where i want to go to here now obviously we've got acronym central today i want to introduce you to something called the efferent nervous system the efferent nervous system now there's no drawing for this i'm going to talk you through it and see if we can get a really good understanding of what we mean by the efferent nervous system first of all its other name is the motor nervous system now you might be aware of the term motor in relation to kind of movement and um, contraction of muscle etc etc and that's exactly why because this system it controls movement. Now, obviously, other parts of the nervous system are going to be involved in other processes of the body, uh, but the efferent system controls movement. Therefore, it is directly related to muscle contraction. Now, we're going to look in some detail at how muscle contraction actually operates. We're going to look at sliding filament theory in other parts of this course. We're going to look at all kinds of factors. We're also going to look at control and things like open and closed loop control in our psychology course, for example. But we know that the efferent nervous system controls muscular contraction, and it is broken into two spheres. Okay, We have got the somatic efferent system, and we have also got we have also got the autonomic. Now, I'm actually going to start with the second one, the autonomic system here, because it kind of, it's fairly obvious what we're talking about here. This controls involuntary movement. Now, start to reflect, maybe during exercise, which kind of involuntary movements might be required. So, for example, we might be talking about something like heart rate. That is a muscular contraction in the heart, that is completely involuntary, right? It increases when we begin to exercise. We go to the gym, we get on the treadmill, it goes up or down after we come off or lower intensity, whatever. So heart rate as an example, but we've also got other examples. We've got things like vasoconstriction, and I won't write in here because I've run out of space, but also vasodilation of muscles. Now, vasoconstriction dilation is all about smooth muscles that surround things like blood vessels. And of course, this is about involuntary control. That involuntary control is done by the autonomic system, the autonomic efferent nervous system. But of course, as we've said already, we've also got our somatic system. So if this is about involuntary, what the somatic system does, of course, <laughs> wrong red, whoops, uh, it manages voluntary muscular contractions, okay? And that is why we're particularly interested in things like skeletal muscles, 
So think about the bicep brachii. Think about uh, the vastus lateralis uh, in the quadricep. Think about the uh, deltoid, the, the, the lateral delt, uh, the, the posterior deltoid, for example, during shoulder extension. <coughs> These muscles are controlled via the somatic efferent system. And of course, that means that they are voluntary. We choose to do them. We choose when to do those. Now, I also want to take I've, I've actually not left myself any room to do this a little bit. I want to take our autonomic system further. I want to start to talk about, well, what is involved in this? Well, first of all, the autonomic system is made up of what we call sympathetic. And I realize there's a lot of kind of breakdown here, but it's, it, it, uh, it involves sympathetic and what we call parasympathetic. Now, remember, we are looking, sim, let me write this properly, sympathetic. We are talking here about involuntary control. We are talking about heart rate either increasing or decreasing, uh, smooth muscles, muscles around blood vessels either constricting or dilating, increasing their tone, decreasing their tone. We're talking about respiratory muscles um, uh, contracting harder or less so, and so on and so on. So what do these words sympathetic and parasympathetic actually refer to? Well, first of all, when we're talking about sympathetic, we are talking about the, mu the, the system that is active during threat. So threat can mean anything from our environment. By the way, exercising would be biologically considered a threat in this context. And what we're saying here is that the sympathetic system, it stimulates, it stimulates increase. So think about, for example, heart rate. Think about, for example, I'll just put it as BD for now. We'll relabel this as tidal volume later on. But breathing depth, for example, it stimulates an increase in these. Whereas the parasympathetic system does the opposite of this. It's all about rest conditions, bringing back. So what we're talking about here, this is going to be a, it, stim it stimulates, stimulates decrease. And that decrease, if we use the same examples, could be decreasing our heart rate. It could be decre decreasing our um, uh, <laughs> breathing depth. Uh, I think I just named a German railway system there, D, uh, DB, Deutsche Bahn. Anyway, that's what I'm talking about. It stimulates a decrease in breathing depth, for example. This is the parasympathetic control. And that's what we really understand about this term and this term. Now, this is where it gets particularly interesting for me. I want to introduce you to this little flow. The human being works in the following way. A human being will ex will receive some kind of stimulus, and that stim that stimulus, by the way, folks, that is what we would call a change in the environment. Change in the environment, and that environment, it could be what's going on around you. Let's say a, a boxer sees a, a gloved hand coming towards their chest, and they need to move and evade it. For example, that would be a stimulus. But so would something be like that, like the sense of balance or imbalance if we're doing gymnastics, for example. So we have a stimulus, something like that. Then what we look at, we are now thinking about a receptor. Receptors in the human body are the following things. They are things like the eyes, which of course receive light. They are things like the ears, which of course receive uh, changes in the movement of air and can translate them into sound. But we also have things like proprioceptors in our muscles, in our tendons. We have these little specialized systems that sense, well, okay, something's changed. The, ten the tendons under more pressure. The rugby player in the scrum has got greater tension in the quadricep tendon because they're pushing against the scrum. The receptor receives that information. What that then leads to, if we go down further, that then leads to a coordinator. Now, this is exactly where we come back to our nervous system. The coordinator is the brain and or the spinal cord. So the coordinator, as you can see here, is going to affect a response. It is effectively the decision maker, the executive, that's gonna bring about some kind of response to what's going on. We then experience an effector, an effector, excuse my handwriting, that's an F in there, believe it or not. And these are things like muscles. These are things like tendons, which of course transfer muscular force onto bones. But these could also be things like glands that could secrete things like hormones, for example. And what happens as a result of those effectors? 
we then end up with we then end up with a response and let me say that the response I'll be quite specific here we could just say movement but I'm going to say here I'm going to say that this is going to be in badminton an overhead clear technique that's a shot in badminton if you're not sure by the way so that's a specific shot that's the response that our nervous system can produce but it also could be secretion of a hormone from a gland and we'll come back to that in very near lessons so what are we talking about here we are talking about a nervous system which is made up of a brain the spinal cord which is our central system around that connected are our peripheral nervous system or is our peripheral nervous system that of course is anything that's not the brain and the spinal cord the efferent nervous system is all about controlling movement we've got the somatic which controls you know the movement of the arm the leg etc the eyes we've also got the autonomic which is separate which is involuntary control and separating sympathetic and parasympathetic sympathetic increasing things during threat especially when we start exercising for example parasympathetic bringing those things back to resting levels and we do this via a stimulus which is anything from our environment changes a receptor such as our sense organs and our proprioceptors our brain and spinal cord coordinate response the effectors which are the muscles the tendons and glands put that into effect and the response such as a sporting movement running catching whatever it happens to be occurs in that context thanks for listening